Right, hello, it's one o'clock, so I think we'll make a start. It's fantastic to see so many people here. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Rowie Sweet. I'm from the University of Leicester, and I'm one of the vice presidents. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here at this lecture and to see such a packed room. Um, before we begin, I know not everybody here is a fellow of society, so we generally just give a brief introduction about the society and what it is. It goes back to 1707, when a few like-minded individuals, all men, predictably, got together in the Bear Tavern on the Strand to talk about antiquities and the materiality of the past, if you like. In modern language, it would be we'd talk about the material culture of the past, with a very clear agenda of a need to preserve British antiquities. So the society was always founded with an emphasis upon the history of Britain and its antiquities. It was a very informal gathering and continued in this informal form, moving around various taverns, coffee houses um, of the, around the Strand in this area. But in 1751, it gained a charter of incorporation, which gave it a much more permanent existence and crucially allowed it to hold property and collections. And this is one of the reasons why we have some of these amazing collections, these Tudor portraits hanging in this room. And the charter was charged, charged to society with the encouragement, advancement, and furtherance of a study and knowledge of the antiquities and history of this and other countries. By 1780, the society had become more established and was actually given a permanent place of residence in Somerset House, along with the Royal Society where the society could accommodate its growing library and its museums and had space for regular meetings. The society moved into these premises in Burlington House in 1874, along with the other learned societies in the courtyard. And we continue to focus on fellowship, conservation, research and dissemination of our work. These are still our core objectives and as a registered charity, we're committed to sharing our collections and our work with the public, which we do through public lectures like this, public tours, exhibitions, scholarly research seminars, and a program of publications. If you're interested in finding more about the society, can I suggest you look at the affiliate membership scheme that we launched last year, which allows you to become involved with the society on a more formal basis. I'd like to introduce now our speaker, Michael Wheeler, who will be talking to us about the Apennine Club, a history. And I hope you've noticed that there's a stall selling the books out there. So um, this is a warm up to the purchase. Michael Wheeler is a visiting professor of English at the University of Southampton. He masterminded the project to build the Ruskin Library and was the founding director of the Ruskin Center at Lancaster University. He's lectured in 18 countries overseas, has served as a lay canon of Winchester, and has been a member of the Athenaeum since 2004. His latest books are St. John and the Victorians, The Athenaeum, More Than Just Another Club, and last year, The Year That Shaped the Victorian Age, Loves, Lives, and Letters of 1845. He's currently writing A Spiritual Life of William Gladstone. Thank you very much for that introduction. And let me begin with an apology. I was due to give this talk last year and was then struck down by bronchitis. And so it's been postponed to now. So those of you who had to reschedule, apologies. You'll notice that the subtitle of this book is More Than Just Another London Club compared to the antiquaries, is, is of course a Johnny-come-lately. But one of my themes in today's talk and in the book is the very close relationship between the club and the learned societies. Uh, in the early stages of its life, but also today. On the screen is James Holland's watercolor of around 1836, of the drawing room of the Athenaeum. Charles Darwin 
wrote in a letter of August 1838, I go and dine at the Athenaeum like a gentleman, or rather like a lord. For I'm sure the first evening I sat in that great drawing room, all on a sofa by myself, I felt just like a duke. He was a new member. I'm full of admiration at the Athenaeum. One meets so many people there that one likes to see. And this room that's 100 feet long on the first floor of Decimus Burton's palatial clubhouse has been described as the finest drawing room in London. I think more important for me is that it's been the scene of countless social interactions and above all, discussions on every topic under the sun. Ever since Burton's clubhouse opened in 1830. For six years before that, the Athenaeum had been based in a temporary clubhouse over the way. With the bicentenary in mind, a 2024, some of the senior members came up with the idea of marking the occasion with a substantial history club. Worthy, they said, of the worldwide reputation of the club over two centuries. I was asked to write a proposal for the General Committee, which in February 2011 appointed a history committee, chaired by the redoubtable Brian Gilmore, to prepare an agreement. Clubs love committees. And a memorandum of understanding was prepared and so on. 10,000 hours later, in terms of research and writing time, I always reckon about two thirds research and one third writing, uh, it was finished. 12 chapters, six months per chapter. Now, when we write a book of this kind, what is the research that we're doing? Well, for me, there were two kinds, and I think this is fairly normal. First of all, you've got the broad savanna of the club's political, intellectual, cultural hinterland. And then you've got the very narrow defiles of its wonderfully preserved archive, as you do here. The broad savannas, books on the history of science, for example, on many other specialisms represented by the membership, books on the two, the two world wars, on which I was by no means a specialist, on the history of other clubs, and hundreds of Victorian and Edwardian memoirs. And the problem with memoirs is very few of them have indexes. So you become a master or a mistress of flipping through books and picking out references, which are thin. There are very few references to what I said to Fred um, at the Athenaeum. And these were explored in the club's own library, the finest in clubland, in the nearby London Library, all of a hundred yards from here, founded by Thomas Carlyle, of course, later a member of the club, and in the British Library. Now, if you take the London Library, it is, as you know, open stack. It's common knowledge that influential individuals were members of several clubs in the early 20th century. But it was only by trawling through, believe it or not, a run of who's who, which conveniently are all there um, in a corner on the top floor of the London Library, only by trawling through a few sample names of extremely well-known individuals did I discover that some of these individuals who are a member of three, four, five, six, ten clubs actually change their numerous club affiliation from time to time? A surprising fact, and one that should remind us of the danger of generalization. 
So much of the wide ranging research among printed books carried out in my own library, which includes a run of punch. And it was well worth letting the whole of punch pass under my gaze while writing the book, because if ever you wanted a week by week account of the, the latest headlines, there it is. And punch was very good at punctuating, of, of, of puncturing pomposity. And I think it's very interesting that both the antiquaries and the Athenaeum are subject to some of the best cartoons, because fellows seem to be very teasable in the 18th century and 19th century, and members of the Athenaeum were very teasable in the 19th century for their pomposity. In the later 19th century and early 20th century, the fact that 1,600 candidates were waiting for a decade and a half before coming up for election, this was regarded as a badge of honor. Outsiders regarded the club as conservative and intellectually grand. In 1902, Alfred Kinnear placed the Athenaeum, I quote, at the head of the erudite clubs of life, a magnificent temple dedicated in a sense to literature, the church, and the arts. But outside what Ralph Neville called the foremost modern literary club, its self-proclaimed reserve and dignity were often interpreted as frostiness among non-members and downright hostility among guests who were known as strangers. On the screen is an image of original drawings by Decimus Burton of the drawing room, which he actually labels the library. And you can see the bookcases there. Up until the Second World War, the furniture in the famous drawing room, originally labeled the library, was actually arranged down the middle of the room. If you think of a country house library, that is often so. This was a place then for scholarly pursuits, and billiards were hidden away from view. So quiet was the Athenaeum, so quiet, that Punch reported on the club's addiction to dancing, singing, boxing, and late night debauchery in the only full page article on Clubland in the history of Punch to that day. Mr. Punch's untrustworthy guide to London of 1906 proclaims that, I quote, gambling is so rife among the hierarchy of intellect at the Athenaeum that the frequent headline, raid on a West End club, nine times out of 10 refers to a descent of the police to the Athenaeum. Waterloo Place, it goes on, is dull and decorous enough by day, but at two or 3 a.m., the spectacle of a bevy of prelates judges, fellows of the Royal Society, they could have added antiquities, by the way, flying precipitately before the minions of Scotland Yard lends it a most engaging animation. And I think this hilarious cartoon saying precisely what the Athenaeum was not. Now, apart from visits to a few archives outside the club, including City of Westminster, King's College, London Royal Institution, with which we have very close connections, and Lambeth Palace. The archival work was inside the clubhouse, and our arch archive is quite remarkable. It's very clean, it's very carefully preserved, and we've had a, a, a full-time archivist in, in recent years. So um, I sat in splendid isolation for about six years uh, going through the archive, reading the whole of it. And I was sitting at Thackeray's desk. A very glamorous setting, but those of you who work on archives, and I suspect quite a few of you, uh, you'll know that archives are very often rather unglamorous, pretty dull at times. And you spend the day wading through minutes of the general committee, and then suddenly you come across the nugget that you were hoping for. There's an entry in the General Committee Minutes of 1838 
the year of Darwin's election for this literary club and the crowning of the young queen, Victoria. The club shared an unwritten code of behavior, which on the whole was very carefully followed. It was a very, there were very few sort of lurid examples in the early days of bad behavior. The hall, here we have the hall uh, in 1841, and there were a lot of classical uh, statues in the hall. Uh, it's very gracious. And this is, of course, where members met just inside the, the, the wonderful front doors. In fact, the Athenaeum quickly developed its reputation as being very scholarly, but also rather stiff in atmosphere. But it seemed that when we had a special occasion, it didn't bring out the best in the members. When elaborate preparations were made for members and their families to view the coronation procession, for example, in 1838, we read in the minutes, I quote, the first supply for luncheons was considered enough for 1,000 persons and would have been ample had not members carried off whole dishes of sandwiches and cakes in spite of the orders of the committee and the remonstrances of the servants to different parts of the house. Afterwards, broken glasses and china were found, I quote, in the galleries, balconies, and even on the top of the water closets, and a pail full of fragments was taken up in the drawing room and the balcony the next morning. Shock, horror. Again, a story which goes against the grain of this incredibly quiet and scholarly group. The archive also contains particular documents that are invaluable to the historian, such as the leather-bound collections of papers associated with the centenary celebrations of 100 years ago, 1924, and the first banquet since its foundation. The club wasn't really a banquet holding organization, but in 1902, marking a signal achievement by a number of members, nine of the 12 recipients of the Order of Merit, newly established by King Edward VII, were Athenians. So for the first time a banquet. As the research proceeded, chapters were written, I reported on progress to a group, a history group, who were very helpful, and Dr. Richard Davenport Hines, a leading historian and a reviewer, member of the History Committee, was an invaluable interlocutor who read draft by draft. Uh, only Richard was privy to any discoveries. I particularly recall a long section in draft when I was writing about an acute problem in the clubhouse, which was regarded as, as a palace, a beautiful clubhouse, uh, but, but there was a problem of ventilation. And this problem of ventilation was shared with the new palace of Westminster after the fire of 1834. And anyway, I wrote at some length about this problem of ventilation. Richard kindly commented in the margin that he was losing the will to live. Modifications were made. The aim at the start was to emphasize that I wasn't going to do a, a traditional club history, but to look at the influence, sometimes decisive influence of Athenians on the intellectual, scientific, creative and official life of the nation. Because for me, uh, that the, the key thing about the Athenaeum is not, as it were, the plate glass windows on Pall Mall, which were broken at various points by the mob uh, and by the Luftwaffe, but actually the entrance. This is an anonymous image of 1832 to 1838 uh, of the clubhouse. And the entrance to the clubhouse is, I think, the key image. Because it's the traffic between the interior, with unique facilities for reading, informed conversation, and the exterior, where members of the Athenaeum have been influential. It's here that the genius of the club, I think, is defined. National trends are reflected in the club's formation, its later development, and its re recent reinvention. The book's written for the general reader. And I view the cultural, scientific, and political history of modern Britain from post-Waterloo through to post-modernity, through the lens of this most famous literary club. Literary, of course, in the broad sense uh, of being related to letters or learning. The Athenaeum, founded in 1824, as a haven specifically for scientists, 
artists, writers, along with cabinet ministers and judges. And its founder, John Wilson Croker, was a true blue Tory. He insisted that there was a majority of Whigs serving on the inaugural committee, and that members of this new kind of non-partisan, with its close connections I, with the learned society, they were elected on ability rather than birth. And from its origins in the years before the First Reform Act through to its current existence, the Athenaeum has, has adhered to the values that shape the liberal arts and sciences. It's always, for example, been hospitable to competing or indeed conflicting ideas. So that we've had famous figures of the past who enemy number one within their field is already a member, but we carefully elect the enemy. It, in, it gets the conversation going. And in 1928, it was described by the graphic as, quote, the brainiest club in the world. The book begins with a snapshot, or rather a worked up drawing, from 1893. In other words, about halfway through the story of the Athenaeum. This is by J. Walter Wilson. He presented readers of the Illustrated London News with an image of the leading Athenians of the day who'd been gathered in the drawing room on ballot day. Now, you won't be able to see it, but right over here, there is actually a ballot going on. So 10 candidates, after waiting 15 years, are, are up for election. And here, sitting in rather splendid isolation, is Benson, the, the current Archbishop um, of Canterbury. He's in his apron, and he's sitting in rather great splendor. Um, and I think rather impishly, this is Professor Huxley. And I think the artist is having fun. Huxley has a little paper in his hand, and I think <laughs> Huxley is just going up to the, the Archbishop with something inflammatory. Um, but the choice of who is here, uh, and there is a key, um, it, it's, it's something I go into in some detail uh, in, in the book. Part one in the book takes its title from Croker's correspondence with Sir Humphrey Davy, who of course was president of the Royal Society. And Davy was a reformer of the Royal Society. He wanted to professionalize it. The vast majority of fellows were not scientists. And he thought it would be great to have a club that could be the club for fellows to allow the society to concentrate on being more professional. It didn't actually work, but a huge number of fellows did indeed become members of the Athenaeum and had a very short distance to walk to their clubhouse. And Croker, who of course was first secretary at the Admiralty, he wrote, everything must have a beginning. And he proposed this new kind of club. He was already not only first secretary of the Admiralty, he was very involved at the Union Club in Trafalgar Square, now Canada House. He was very involved at John Murray's, the publisher up in Albemarle Street. He was very involved at Somerset House in the the three great learned societies of which you're one. Um, he knew everybody in London. He knew everyone in the Palace of Westminster. He knew Prince Regent very well. And his web, his network, is very like the end of George Eliot's Middlemarch, where George Eliot says, it's like a spider's web. You pull one little thread and the whole web moves. And this was Croker's web. And he brought in members from right across the spectrum. We can see what Croker meant when he referred to these times as being propitious for the formation of a new London club. The 1820s were a fascinating decade when professionalization within the sciences 
uh, was hurrying along after the victory against the French, when all kinds of new learned societies were being formed, as well as uh, the more established learned societies. And there was much talk at the time uh, of a real intellectual ferment. And I think Croker realized that he could catch the moment The original members were the first thousand members. Recruitment began, and within a year, there were a thousand members. At the club's first home at 12 Waterloo Place. The honorary secretary was Michael Faraday, who'd been dragged away from his bench up at the RI because he was, of course, uh, Davy's underling. He was virtually treated as a servant by Davy. He had no choice. And if you look at his uh, Faraday's experiment diaries, you'll find that they virtually stopped for six months while he got the Athenaeum going. And the moment he managed to walk out, because they decided to actually pay the secretary, uh, and he went back to his experiments, uh, British science changed direction because Faraday was free again. Why did it take six years to build our own clubhouse. Well, that's the subject of my third chapter, which explains how Desmond, Desmus Burton's design related to the Greek revival in architecture, to the most ambitious building program in London since the Great Fire, and to the politics associated with Crown land. Because you'll recall that Nash's project, uh, inspired by the Prince Regent, was the Royal Mile that was intended to link the Regent's Park with St. James's Park. And it's to be pretty much a straight line. We think of Regent Street, the kink in the middle, uh, for all kinds of technical reasons, uh, because Carlton House is at the bottom of that a stretch, and this is a royal palace. Now, in fact, before the Athenaeum found its current site, there were two other possibilities, one of which was just around the corner. It didn't work out. But the other, I think, is much more intriguing. And it's on the screen. This is Charing Cross, um, 1826, James of Bazier. This is from the city of Westminster Archive. And what we have here is, um, think of Trafalgar Square, here we have St. Martin's Church. This is the vicar's house. And that, the Athenaeum. So there was a plan for it to be facing Trafalgar Square, pretty much where Af South Africa House is now, um, with stabling behind. So we would today be facing the noise and bustle of Trafalgar Square, and we'd have stabling at the back or its equivalent. In fact, of course, it turned out that the demolition of Carlton House made it possible to build the modern clubhouses that we have today in Pall Mall. The second part of the book, uh, Victorian Grandeur, uh, begins with a chapter which describes members' contribution to the development of an increasingly expansive and confident nation up to the 1850s to members in terms of the exchange of ideas as well as of gossip. Evidence is hard to find, as I've said. Where do you find evidence of conversations? Occasionally you can hit gold. So for example, Emerson, as a visitor from, the, from America, he became an honorary member and thank goodness, wrote home regularly to his wife. And he described uh, literary and intellectual London at considerable length in his letters. And one of them goes into some detail about how it was in the clubhouse. In 1830, when the new clubhouse opened, a, a new rule was brought in called Rule 2, where nine men could skip past the waiting list. These would be people of particular eminence or of enormous potential, because the committee wanted to be true to the original aim of scientists, artists, writers. And so the committee 
could bring in nine people who represented those three areas uh, who were particularly distinguished. Um, and, and this is very interesting. In the book, I look at the example of John Ruskin, who came in at a very young age um, as a Rule 2 member because of his the amazing impact of Modern Painters, Volume 1, but his worldwide reputation already. In Chapter 5, I consider the club's tradition of high thinking and plain living and the building structural problems, which posed a threat to the exactness and comfort that members expected. Based on new findings, both architectural and bibliographical, I relate the problems of the club, including that one of ventilation to the Palace of Westminster. Now, in Chapter 6, I examine a very important moment in 19th century history, the 1860s and through to the 1890s, when liberal opinion in politics, religion, and science assumed the ascendancy in Britain. And the Athenaeum strove to maintain its tradition of tolerance and balance in the age of Darwin and his supporters, who formed a group you may have heard of called the X Club, whose views conflicted with those of most of the ever-present and often conservative bishops. And this was a flashpoint. And I think for the first time, possibly the last time, a group of members decided to have a go at taking over the general committee and having a very strong line on what should happen next, on who the membership should be and where the club was going. But it's at flashpoints like this that the relationship between national developments and the life of the club, conducted on the margins between the private and the public. And there I think we have the key to what these clubs were. Public life, private life, and where they overlap is club life. The title of part three, Reserve and Dignity, refers to the prevailing manners of both the club and polite society. Chapter 7 focuses on the period from 1890 to 1914. It's a period of prosperity. Um, the Athenaeum reaffirmed its identity as the leading literary club and celebrated the success of its most eminent members. But in chapter 8, which I've entitled Culture Wars, we come to that short period, the four tumultuous years of the First World War. The club had already refurbished itself. Pointer and Alma Tadema had really changed the interior of the club. Um, an attic floor had been added. But what was the club like actually during a war? Well, it never closed and in fact became very busy. And on the screen is another punch cartoon, When William Comes to Town. This shows the Kaiser mounting the steps of the clubhouse. So here's another example of the club's entrance being used in a symbolic way. When William comes with all his might and sets the Thames alight, I shouldn't be at all surprised if London town were tutanized. Bidding his bands to play Te Deum, he'll occupy the Athenaeum, and so on. So during the First World War, um, the club served again as a meeting place for those who in Whitehall were running the war from London for many, many who were serving, uh, were serving officers during the war. Um, and of course, I've chronicled the, the losses that the, the, the club uh, suffered. The clubhouse was particularly busy at lunchtimes during the war, um, when there was a possibility for those working in Whitehall to speak in confidence because of the rule that any conversation that happens inside the Athenaeum does not go outside those doors. Um, there was much exchange of ideas and of confidences. And in fact, if you wanted to know what was going on, Lutchins, the architect who worked just 
50 yards from here, um, walked down to the clubhouse at the outbreak of the First World War, I quote, to find out what was going on. And so the latest news was often available very fast. Chapter 9, A Room Full of Owls, uh, as Athenians are called, uh, considers the 1920s and 30s decades of economic turmoil, social insecurity. And this is when the club became very, very established. Lords Wreath, Macmillan and others, and then Archbishop Temple. But it was also a period of innovation the ending of the ballot, the introduction of bedrooms for members, monthly talk dinners, and wait for it, an annex where ladies could be entertained. Can you believe it? Change, or rather adaptation, was underway. And the three chapters in the final part of the book brings the story up to the present. Chapter 10 looks at the second world, particularly focusing on the contribution of Athenian scientists for example, to the development of radar. And an example is Sir Henry Tizard, who was asked by government to enable the development of radar, which was crucial, of course, uh, during that conflict. And he not only uh, proposed huge numbers of members, members to the club, just pre-war and during the war, but he also brought together people who he wanted to discuss top secret stuff relating to science. Because as you know, in wartime, developments in science and in medicine accelerate enormously as so much investment is going into new technologies and techniques. And so medics in the field also uh, played an important part in this. We managed also to elect uh, an individual you will have heard of killed Kim Philby, and Kim Philby was elected because although he was in his 20s when he joined the club, um, there were letters exchanged which were saying, yes, he's very young, but his father's a member, and he's of the right sort. And of course, it's, it interests me very much that we had Kilby sitting in the Athenaeum, and at least two of the other Cambridge spies were residing next door in the Travellers, and, and another door away in the Reform Club. Um, the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s, we think of Peter Hitchens' book, is prominent in Chapter 11, along with the impact of Butler's Education Act and the debate on the new meritocracy. Think of Michael Young's book. And one of the unique things about the Athenaeum is that when you're proposed, there are two columns. One is on your work, because it's assumed that in some way you've made a contribution through your work. Originally, it would be through your publications and still is in many ways. And secondly, that you are clubbable, quote unquote. Define clubbable. In the final chapter, I describe how the club has reinvented itself over the last 30 years. First of all, the welcome addition of women to the membership in 2002, the rapid expansion of events at the Athenaeum, a development that would have astounded members in an earlier era. Even the first talk dinner, as they're known, was regarded as a, a rather dodgy experiment in 1926 when they started. But today we have talks, concerts, films, discussion groups, dining clubs, wine tastings, which fill a calendar. And so the word ballot used to mean, you know, a ballot box and all of that. But the ballot now is a ballot to get to one of these events, so popular are they. Outside visits to libraries, theatres, car rallies, ski slopes proliferate. Why did that expansion occur? And how significant has it been in terms of the reinvention of the club? Well, that's a question we might discuss a little later. Heather McCullum of Yale University Press and her team did a great, great job. And the, the, the book came out in the middle of, of the pandemic. And it was decided 
uh, that every member of the club should receive a copy, and it plumped through their letterboxes when they weren't allowed to go out. So it was quite widely read by the membership. So Michael Palin kindly joined me for a conversation about the book, which is now on the club's YouTube and so on. It was lovely that a special binding of the book was made. It's been a great honor and a great pleasure to write this book. And the connections you know, with this place are, are significant. Just to orientate us a little bit, this is a bird's eye view. Um, got the United Services Club here. Nash, of course, was the architect. The deal was from Woods and Forest that Nash, who not only was responsible for this ro ro great royal progress, um, but th the two clubhouses would match. They'd be pretty much identical. Nash, I don't know if you know this, was a very, very naughty boy. And he pulled the wool over the eyes of the Committee of the Athenaeum to the extent that when his naughtiness came out, Woods and Forest said, right, Athenaeum, you can have whatever you like in terms of the decoration of the club. And that is why we have the famous Pan-Athenaic freeze. Uh, and Nash's clubhouse was in the doghouse. We were the good boys now. And having built that, this is where um, Carlton House was. Then, of course, we have the travelers here. We have the enormous reform club here. And this is the old Carlton club which took a direct hit during the Second World War um, and then moved to St. James's Street, where it currently is. And this is Waterloo Place at an early date. And this is number 12. This is where we lived from 1824 to 1830. And in fact, members could see the building of their new clubhouse from that site. Those who entered those portals over those six years, the early members. We know because we have a project that was a spin-off from my research uh, called the Early Members Project, where members of the club can go on, go to our website and see the, uh, the, the biographies of, of the early members. And if you search antiquaries, 53 uh, were antiquaries. Uh, your president, um, Lord Aberdeen, in 1824, um, was an ex officio trustee because the connection between the Athenaeum and the learned societies was such that originally three trustees were the presidents of the three leading learned societies. It shows you how linked they were. And in fact, his very important book uh, on Grecian taste, uh, published uh, in the 1820s, had an enormous influence on the last part of the Grecian revival, uh, which in a way came to a peak around 1820. And Decimus Burton, it's the sort of last gasp, if, if you like, uh, very much shaped by the ideas of, of Aberdeen, who was a member of the building committee of the Athenaeum. So the relationship is, is very close. And in fact, Ruskin, his Rule 2 membership went through when the then president um, of the Society of Antiquaries was in the chair. So, ladies and gentlemen, the principles on which the Athenaeum uh, was created, um, different though they may be in certain respects uh, from your own, uh, you can see the connections are significant. And although it's true that I think members of the leading uh, learned societies were, of course, members of many other clubs, this particular relationship uh, with the Athenaeum were, was very, very strong. Thank you very much. To thank Michael for a fascinating insight into the Athenaeum, also for keeping to time so beautifully, so there is in fact time.
the questions, which isn't always the case with our lunchtime speakers, it has to be said. So can I invite anybody to come up with a question for Michael about the Athenaeum? Yes, at the front. If you could just wait for the microphone to come to you, that would be great. Thank you, thank you. Um, did the Athenaeum always allow members to bring guests? Because a lot of clubs didn't on the basis a member shouldn't be forced to meet anybody in his club that he wouldn't invite to his home. Very, very good question. The answer is today, absolutely. And a member of the Athenaeum, like I think a lot of clubs, love to bring in guests who are non-members. But what you raise, sir, is a very interesting question about our history. Because when it was first suggested in, I think it was probably the, the 1860s, there began to be a movement, but perhaps the guests who were known, and anyone who is not a member was a stranger, uh, if they even put their nose round the front door, you know, would be pushed out. Um, the first suggestion that perhaps there could be special dinners that could be held behind closed doors, which would be which would include non-members. Some members um, were so angry that on one occasion. Uh, one opened the door to one of these private dinners, rolled an armchair into the middle of the room, and insisted on reading a newspaper in order to interrupt the whole thing. Um, now, I'm glad to say that things improved, and, and gradually it did become a convention that there were two kinds of special dinner. One would be a, a dinner which is in a, in a, a room off the hall, um, which would be private to members only. So there might be a, a dozen people who might well include, say, the current Archbishop of Canterbury or the Prime Minister or various big shots, uh, but also intellectual groups or professional groups. So that, for example, the engineers, of, of whom we had many, um, and much of the early Victorian infrastructure was, was built by these engineers, they would have an annual dinner of their own. But some of them were... Um, where, which were professional, bringing in non-members. And then in the 20th century, more and more, it became possible, yes, for non-members oh, to come along. They even welcome me as a reciprocal member now. I believe that the Athenaeum was always extremely conservative with a small C. How conservative was it with a big C? And how conservative is it now? Very good question. Um, for those of you that, that did everyone hear that? Um, OK, it, it's always been known as conservative with a small C. How conservative with a large C? <laughs> well, it is interesting, actually, that Croker, of course, was an ultra Tory. He was very, very much a, a true blue. Um, and everything changed in 1830, you know. Um, but as I said in my talk, the crucial point was that so many of the clubs and their initial foundation, I'm talking about the, the post-Waterloo clubs, um, were political. And the more traditional clubs, Whites and Brooks and so on, and then the Boodles and, and others, they were much more to do with the blood you know, your, your family history and where you come from. And a lot of those were conservative with a big C, not Brooks's, because, of course, you, you know, they were Whig in orientation at that time. Um, so that by the end of the 19th century, there were nine clubs in central London devoted to the Conservative Party with a large C. The Athenaeum had set its face totally against that and had said, no, it's a non-partisan point is it's, it's, a, it's a literary club, it's an intellectual club. Having said that, there are a lot of, lot of Tories, a lot of, a lot of um, capital C uh, members. But I would say, broadly speaking, um, how can one say it? Uh, this is, it was and probably still is broadly Whiggish. I would say rather like the whole liberal arts tradition in this country, um, is liberal with a small L, and perhaps it's Whiggish with a small W. Thank 
Thank you for a very interesting talk. Was there any or much debate at the beginning about the name of the club? Very good question. And thank you for filling that particular lacuna. Um, there was, there, the, if you go back to the, the very first entries in our um, general committee minutes, um, there's Faraday's handwriting. And the first meeting was on the 16th of February, 1824. Now, stop me if I'm wrong, but I think that's fairly soon, our bicentenary. It's just coming up for that date. And when he comes to refer to the club, there's a space before the word club. They hadn't decided what to call it. And at first, they made the most idiotic proposal. It was going to be called the society. Now, I mean, can you think of anything more dark? And of course, quite quickly, an alternative was found. And Athenaeum, with its very strong classical reference, uh, as a meeting place, you know, uh, with that whole Hellenic emphasis of the day. I mean, this was a Hellenic period, wasn't it, in terms of, you know, intellectual activity and the arts. Athenaeum was just right as a meeting place, place for conversation, place for the exchange of ideas. And so the Athenaeum, everyone said, that's absolutely perfect. Uh, and that's that's how we got the name. I don't think there was any dispute, apart from the idiocy of calling it the society. I seem to remember being told that the famous ballad box, which you alluded to in the Athenaeum, was at one time put or given on temporary loan to this society for the for use in this, in this very room for the election of fellows. Have I got that right? Yes, and you have. Has it ever been returned? Yes, it has. Uh, yes, and I, it's, very, it's very good to see you. Um, yes, indeed, um, it, it did come here, and then it came back. And I suspect um, in, in the coming months, when we are celebrating the bicentenary, um, it'll be on display. I gather that um, you, you, you had several ballot boxes here and you yeah. and and th th by having several ballot boxes you can in fact elect more fellows people at once yes but um the days of voting in person have sadly passed people want to vote electronically and also having physical ballot boxes actually puts a physical limit on the number of people you can elect at any one time so we have gone electronic balloting but we still have the ballot boxes we can take them out and scrape them occasionally when we want to admire them we had a problem with our ballot box um, because things could get a bit tricky. Um, on ballot day, um, when a lot of members would come in and fill the drawing room, you could have 200 people there. Uh, Robert Browning, the poet, he would stand on the staircase and he described himself as like a great spider wanting to catch people as they came up the staircase. And he was lobbying for his candidate. And this, so there was lobbying going on. Blackballing was happening it, quite moderately, I think, at the Athenaeum. Um, but there was an occasion um, when one member started to um, try to rig it all by putting his vote into the ballot box, leaving the room and going through the other entrance and coming around for a second time. So as we know, in democracy, it's always best to vote early and vote often. Um, and it did seem that the Athenaeum at one point was doing that. So it wasn't, in, it wasn't in, infallible, the ballot box. But as you know, the little cork balls uh, were not colored, but there, there was you know, the black side and the white side. And you put your hand in, and you put it into yay or nay, which side. And, and the proportion to get a blackballing changes over time. I mean, I could be so boring with this subject forever, but you know, how do you decide it's got to be one in 10 black balls or is it one in 15? These things change with the politics, but like your fellows, um, we too are all very electronic now.
Um, has anyone yeah. famous been banned and why? Has anyone famous been banned and why? Um, with, uh, the thing is, so liberal, I think, <laughs> it's the Athenaeum. But I think it's the softest organization I've ever looked at, to be honest. Um, the, it's very, very rare to have difficulties in a place like the Athenaeum. Sometimes people have had a funny turn. There was somebody who arrived with a sword in the hall and was sort of rushing around with his sword, waving over his head. But the porter was very expert. He managed him to get out of the clubhouse and, and send him off for medical attention. Um, but, I mean, to give you just one little example, there was a member who was notorious for his, his drinking habits who uh, turned up outrageously drunk. And they tried to push him out of the clubhouse, and there were complaints up in the, you know, in the coffee room, which is where you cannot drink coffee, but you can eat dinner and so on. Um, and in the end, what happened was that a letter was written from the general committee to this member saying, you know, if you don't, if you don't sort yourself out, you know, um, we will have to have a meeting to discuss you, you see. So he then became outrageously drunk again and was quietly let out. But in the end, and it's so difficult, he, he wrote a letter of abject groveling apology and the general committee let him off. So, no, I mean, we have had controversial members, not only as spy, but of course we did have uh, the greatest, uh, the most successful fundraiser um, of the late 20th century in London. Uh, the man who conned everybody from the Queen Mother through the Prime Minister to the, the committee um, of the Athenaeum uh, called Jimmy Savile. And here was a most embarrassing part of our history. Um, when the, the full horror came out, the committee of the Athenaeum met to discuss whether his membership should be struck from the record. And quite rightly, in my view, it was decided absolutely not. Uh, it was a terrible mistake. And indeed, there are many wonderful stories of members being extremely embarrassed by someone who never quite understood the conventions of the club. Um, no. It's a historical event, like one or two spies. You cannot tinker with history. Thank you for your talk. Uh, how would you describe the ethos of the club today? Where is this person? Could, could, you, could you kindly stand up? Yes, sure. Ah, that's better. Thank you. How would you describe the ethos of the I'm lip today? reading, you see. Sorry? I'm lip reading. Oh, I see. Uh, how would you describe the ethos of the club today? The ethos of the club today um, was, I would say, the ethos of the club today is pretty close to how it has always been. And it is a hospitable and welcoming place. I'm seeing various smiles around the room, um, as if people have read various articles. Um, it, it, there has been a lively debate recently, uh, which I think it'd be better for me not to go into in any detail. Um, but the ethos of the club, in my view, remains, as always, uh, very close to the ideals of, um, of the liberal arts, of exchange of ideas. Um, and uh, I'd say that ethos uh, will be maintained over my dead body. If you wrote the book all over again, would you write anything differently? There are two or three members, of, there are two or three people in this room who know quite a lot about what's happened very recently, I can tell. And the answer is, of course, that my last chapter um, is, is entitled Plus a Change, and makes the argument um, that over 200 years, the ideals of the club as originally um, set out have remained pretty much as they always have been. 
And since I finished writing this book in 2017, you know, that, that it has been quite interesting. There have been debates about uh, future directions. It's not unlike, I think, the last time there were discussions, as I point out sometimes to my fellow members, was in 1864. Uh, and so if I were to rewrite now and were writing a supplement, I would have to write, a, um, to write an account of, of recent debates. But broadly speaking, I stand by everything I wrote in August, up to August 2017. It's called diplomacy. Thank you very much for such a discreet <laughs> response to the question and for giving us a really fascinating insight into the Athenaeum, which I know, well, I've certainly walked past plenty of times. I've certainly been in a few times, but I knew very little about its history. So it's been a great pleasure to have you here, Frank Michael. Thank you very much indeed. Um, our, next our next lunchtime lecture takes place on Tuesday, the 5th of March, again at 1 p.m., on Queen Caroline and the power of caricature in Georgian England. And it will be given by Professor Ian Hayward. So I do encourage you to attend that one as well. There's again, well, it's an 18th century, 19th century historian, obviously, I think is interesting, but I think I'm sure it'll be a, a terrific lecture. So thank you very much, Michael. Thank you.